Hi, good morning and welcome to the ZP um, Developer Zone. So we do this every Thursday at 8am London time and we just basically try to answer kind of questions that have come in during the week. Um, this week is quite, well, it's very light for us actually and I think it's basically because um, lots of people are on vacation or thinking about vacation. So um, don't forget we have our ZP Academy um, where you can sort of do some technical background on, or, on the sciences that we do at ZP. And we do do webinars, so we give light support to people um, doing these webinars. Um, for example, we do have um, mostly academic collaborations. Um, we do offer jobs. We have rec been recruiting recently, and we do have our ZP Developer Zone. And we also have our workshops as well. I would say that um, the workshops are probably one of the best places to really get uh, kind of questions answered and you know any kind of gaps in training, let's say. Um, so we do have a whole lot of workshops. The next one is in August. Um, so if you want to attend, that will be in Coventry. There is a big workshop also in Horton in September. That's a two day workshop where we'll, everyone makes a bias sensor. Everyone gets a test, things like pH sensors, etc. cetera, um, at that workshop. Um, so we do have a lot of, let's say, um, training opportunities. We do have our Scandinavia sensor summit coming. So this is kind of, um, it's, said to be you know digitizing uh, for a sustainable future but this kind of means you know sensors in water um, sensors in aquaculture sensors below water uh, but it also means sort of sensors for the gas phase sensors in health sensors in agriculture as well so it's a very kind of um more industry application driven work um, conference rather than sort of um deep science i mean the, you know the deep science is in there but we're more talking about how to solve real problems as opposed to just you know, my sensor is better than your kind of sensor kind of um, conference. So as I say, we do have a workshop on the 9th of August, and this will be particularly um, appropriate to anyone um, doing biosensing at the moment. The question this week is feedback on our pH sensor. So I had um, some really quite a nice um, written um, report, let's say, back on the, um, on the pH sensors. I just want to kind of dive into that. I'd actually written something about how to calibrate a pH sensor, something probably like 2018, but um, and these people had found it. So if you're a ZP customer, I kind of written a protocol, I think, to help somebody out once upon a time. I think one of the biggest problems I sometimes have is because if you have a very engineering background, then this kind of wet science can be a little bit, um, no problems. It's just as hard for a scientist to become an engineer as an engineer to become a scientist. But these days we all have to be mixed up anyway. We're all... We're all scientists and engineers and data scientists. Um, step number one, when calibrating a pH sensor, I said, you know, put it in a known pH solution. I've suggested pH 10. Um, I remember I was a sort of, you know, leave it standing for a minute and on the last 10 seconds, take some data points. Similarly, um, put it in another calibration solution, pH um, four, leave it there for about 60 seconds and take the last 10 data points. Um, I did say rinse it with DI water between those two so you don't get this kind of cross-contamination. Then you can do a two-point calibration um, and then you can measure your unknown sample. Essentially, look at the potential, look at your potential on the graph and see what kind of pH um, that gives you. Um, and um, I did say here, note um, that the more the calibration solution resembles the actual sample, the more accurate the result will be. Now, I did say here for very complex samples, it may be necessary to make the calibration solution in the actual sample matrix. You will see us when we're doing things like our chili sensor, you'll see us take a one sample of um, the chili sauce and we put it in nine volumes of a buffer. Um, and that's because we're trying to get rid of the matrix effect. Matrix effect is just parameters that are otherwise come in with the sample and then and would otherwise interfere with the um, test. Now, in this case, I think what they have is um, they have a difference in chloride concentration between um, tap water and um, the buffer solution. But I will dig into that um, a little bit deeper in this um, presentation. So they did exactly what I said, what I had suggested um, on the website. As I say, that was about five years ago. Um, they put them in pH 10. Great. Got results. Put in rinsed it, put in pH 4, got a result, made a two-point calibration. And then they put in their um, sample and they got a result. Um, I've, in terms of hardware, they're using an Arduino. Um, 
they are they are using a high impedance extra board here i took it out of the image because i wanted to sort of you know if they've gone and made the effort to find that extra board it may have come off our website but otherwise i've, I've covered it up but essentially they're using an arduino and they're using a couple of a connector from zp and the pzp ph sensors which is all great um if you want to kind of find some of that stuff how to measure pH with an Arduino is a link here. Open source potential stats. Um, there are connectors and our pH. Uh, in fact, here I've got pH calibration solutions. So I've actually forgotten to put the pH sensor in there. Anyway, nice setup. Um, it all looks pretty good. I did have a look at their data. Um, what's interesting is that what they do is they, and the, in, in line with what I suggested on the website anyway, they let it sit for 60 seconds and then they take the last 10 seconds so you can see the signal is really stable um, at this point. Um, it's kind of, um, you know, if I did a sort of coefficient of variation measurement on this, it's like, no, you know, the fluctuations, let's say, are, you know, the noise is about less than 1%. And similarly at pH 4, the, the noise, let's say, is less than uh, 1%. So um, to be fair, the electronics look pretty good. Um, and then they can do a two-point calibration. Now, what I want to say here is, what you'll notice is that the, um, let's say the signal is equal to the um, sensitivity or the slope plus an offset. Um, so that, that's, that slope or sensitivity is about 24 millivolts per pH here. Um, and their offset is 163. They've sort of done it again. They've done a three point calibration. So I'm pleased because obviously it tells me that the pH sensors are working, you know, in themselves are working pretty well. Now, what's interesting is see that the slope here is 24 millivolts um, per pH, which is really similar to the other experiment. So that I'm happy about. And uh, but, but what they will have noticed is that their offset has shifted. Now, um, this is really part of our workshops, but um, pH sensors are a, are a example of potentiometric sensors. So whenever you use a pH sensor in the lab, you always do a one or two point calibration. And I know I've said this lots in the past, and it's a repetition. But the reason you do that is, is actually because this, the offset, every time you plug in a pH sensor and, and use it, a pH probe, the offset shifts around. This offset is really kind of sensitive. So the sensitivity or the slope itself is actually really well conserved. And this, these people's data shows that. Two experiments, they got about 24 millivolts per pH both times. But on this second experiment, the offset shifted, and it's shifted by about 40 millivolts. It's about 25% um, shift. But this is not uncommon, and every that's why every pH meter in every lab, you'll always find them with a, um, you'll always find them with calibration solutions next term. And it's not because of the sensitivity, it's actually because of the offset shift around. Here's um, five sensors at ZP. And, you know, we have, we, the offsets here are all pretty good, but there is one of them that has a very different offset. Um, you could put it that down to manufacturing, but it's really just like if we take the same sensor, we get a good, um, let's say, set of data where the signal's changing and, you know, it, it comes back again. And then we do it again. We'll get, again, the same steps, but the offset will have changed. So offset is really sensitive. And people will ask us, now I actually do have some, um, solutions for fixing offset but this is really something that we would only do or only reveal in really considerable projects so let's go back to that to their um, let's go back to their points actually which I want to sort of so first of all the data looks 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 good I mean it, you know, it's linear um, it's obviously not hard to be linear when you've got two data points but it's nice that you have another second set of data and it's consistent with the first set except that the offset shifted but I'm also saying offset does shift um, and, you know, if I was going to give you anecdotal evidence of that, that's why every pH meter in the world has a couple of calibration solutions next to it. It's not because the sensitivity is changing, it's because the offset is changing. Um, so when they do this, they, um, they, they measure the pH of their sample um, with a probe and with a sensor, and they actually end up with a kind of error of like 16%. Right, so let me comment upon this. Um, so the reason this is going on is because when you look at our um, pH sensor, we have our working electrodes and we have our reference electrodes. Um, now the reference electrode in one of these solid state devices at the moment, I, I did check with our 
um, orders and shipping department, they have a reference electrode that is not chloride resilient. And I don't want people to start on chloride resilient reference electrodes because I think you have to, if you're going to do the work on yourselves, you have to kind of go on this journey and you have to go on this journey of you just test your pH sensor as is. You sort of discover then that, you know, what these problems are and then you have to start solving them. Otherwise, you just jump into the sort of final solution. But if you don't go along this learning curve on your own, um, you can't later fix problems because you just sort of gave you this out of the box solution. It all worked great, but you didn't learn anything. Um, so what's happening here is this, that the... Um, when the, in, their, in the buffers that are used, there's a chloride um, concentration. I suspect that in the, um, in the sample that they have, there is no chloride concentration. But silver silver chloride is really a pseudo reference electrode that if you change the chloride concentration, it changes its potential. So they have a potential at their working electrode, but their reference electrode is the guy that's actually shifted and it's shifting slightly because of the chloride. And this shifting then makes it them think that you know, they see this chloride, the reference electrode shifting, but they interpret it as this working electrode, but it's actually the reference electrode. Now, you don't have this problem in um, classical pH probes. The problem with classical pH probes is they're expensive, they're bulky, they're not robust, um, but they have a silver silver chloride wire in them, and it's in a concentrated solution of like three, um, three molar KCl, um, so it's in a saturated solution and it's sitting in its own little reservoir. So what this means then is um, they're not, these classical pH probes are not particularly chloride sensitive. They do have problems, by the way. They have more problems than people realize. People just take the values off them as face value. But in reality, they're sort of, you know, they're only approximate themselves. But that said, the chloride reservoir is isolated from the sample and the silver silver chloride is sitting in this um, reservoir. So I am going to talk now about um, this pH sensor in general looks good and the electronics look good. The offset, I'm not, I, um, I'm not, I'm not worried about it. If they need to fix it, then that's really a project with ZP. Um, but let's talk about this, let's say, error between um, what they measure and what and what the, the what the ZP pH sensor is doing. So one way of fixing it, by the way, is to um, we have a chloride resilient formulation. So I will link to this in a minute. You put a drop of that on uh, here. I put it on a, on the different electrode. It doesn't matter which reference electrode you do, but we happen to use this small one and we spread it along. Um, and I have put a link to that as well. So what we're trying to do with this formulation is actually fix the chloride concentration on the reference electrode. So at the moment, the reference electrode is taking a potential that's dictated by the solution. If the solution has no chloride in it, that's the, when I say the solution, the sample has no chloride in it, then that's probably the biggest source of signal error. Um, and we do have a solution. The reason I don't like to just people jump into this, because if you don't need it, you don't use it. But if you do need it, then you will have to start um, fixing that chloride concentration. So what's going on? Part of your air is because tap water doesn't have chloride in it. That's my sort of biggest suspicion. Um, see, and depending on the depending on the application, sometimes that doesn't matter. See, so if we were measuring pH in a sample, you know, we would sort of we would actually add the chloride to the sample in order to fix the chloride because we know what our applications are. So we would have fixed it and I've, um, by actually putting chloride into the sample. It may not work in your situation i get it and that's why i'm therefore suggesting some other ways you can just correct it mathematically if it's consistent this kind of error then it's called you know you can you can you can tag it as a matrix effect and you can correct for it now before you think that's horrific most glucose strips are actually um you know they the, the blood is quite variable they call it the matrix effect and they mathematically correct for it so don't think this is a horrendous thing to do. It happens in real world devices. You could create your own um, calibration solutions. Um, and I was just sort of thinking about it a little bit and thinking, right, well, you could make, you possibly make a, take your sample, you know, your real sample, make a pH four of it by adding, and I, I thought maybe phosphoric acid would be the right um, 
acid to use. I'm trying to avoid things that would have otherwise messed up the electrode. So that would be kind of end up being your pH 4 solution. And then you could add s very small amounts of sodium hydroxide to another um, sample to make it pH 10. So you've essentially now made your calibration solutions out of your sample. And that was to my slide several uh, slides up where I actually say, if you want to get the most accurate, let's say, calibration routine, then you calibrate in your sample itself. Um, so let's say you were sort of making a real product and you were really getting into manufacturing. You would actually end up, it's best to calibrate in, you know, we've given you synthetic calibration solutions, um, but in the end, we would end up, you know, calibrating in solutions that most represented our actual tests. Um, so you can, number one, where does this error come from? I think it mostly comes from the chloride. You, I, you could just mathematically fix it. That would be the simplest thing to do. You could come up with a new calibration routine. I've only quickly, I'm a chemist, guessed at how you would do it. So I would take the sample, maybe add some phosphoric acid to make it pH 4, take the sample, add some sodium hydroxide to make it pH 10. You can make a chloride less sensitive reference electrode. A lot of people like this because it's simple. It seems like the most simple thing to do where you just take, we, we, it says here 80 sensors. I don't know why that's 80. I need to change that to much more than 80, probably more like 800. But anyway, it's a solution where we've, um, we've immobilized the chloride and you sort of, you put it onto the reference electrode and it tries to hold chloride next to the um, reference electrode. People like that because it feels simple, but life is never that simple, but that is um, also one way of um, dealing with it as well. If you want to discuss this in more detail, I would suggest definitely suggest the workshop in August, um, and I put a link to that. So it's a bit shorter this week. As I say, we only had one question, um, and it was around the pH um, sensor, but very nice write-up, very high quality. I really appreciated it. it. made my life much easier, and I hope um, you can see I put some slides together and give this quite a lot of thought. Okay, thanks very much. Appreciate it.